On the 20 slides shown below, I present the original photographs of the Second World War from the German archive, which are in my collection. These photos are from my collection department, Wehrmacht on the Eastern and Western Fronts. If you like it, subscribe to my YouTube, like it, so you don't miss the new weekly presentations. If you would like to order 5 inches by 7 inches copies of these photos from the original, you can specify which photos you would like to receive. Laboratory quality. Enjoy your viewing. Adolf Joseph Ferdinand Galland was a German Luftwaffe general and flying ace who served throughout the Second World War in Europe. He flew 705 combat missions, and fought on the Western Front and in the defense of the Reich. Born, March 19, 1912, Herten, Germany. Died, February 9, 1996, Remagen, Germany. Spouse, Heidi Horn, M. 1984-1996, Hannah Lies Ladwine, M. 1963-1973, Sylvinia von Dunhoff, M. 1954-1963 Children, Andreas Hubertis. Buried, February 21, 1996, St. Laurentius Churchyard, Remagen. Siblings, Wilhelm Ferdinand Galland, Paul Galland, Fritz Galland. Galland, who was born in Westerholt, Westphalia became a glider pilot in 1929 before he joined the Lufthansa. In 1932, he graduated as a pilot at the Deutsche Verkehrs Flieger Schule. German Commercial Flyers School, in Braunschweig before applying to join the Reichswehr of the Weimar Republic later in the year. Galland's application was accepted, but he never took up the offer. In February 1934, he was transferred to the Luftwaffe. In 1937, during the Spanish Civil War, he volunteered for the Condor Legion and flew ground attack missions in support of the Nationalists under Francisco Franco. After finishing his tour in 1938 Galland was employed in the Air Ministry writing doctrinal and technical manuals about his experiences as a ground attack pilot. During this period Galland served as an instructor for ground attack units. During the German invasion of Poland in September 1939, he again flew ground attack missions. In early 1940, Galland managed to persuade his superiors to allow him to become a fighter pilot. Galland flew Messerschmitt Bf-109s during the Battle of France and the Battle of Britain. By the end of 1940, his tally of victories had reached 57. In 1941, Galland stayed in France and fought the Royal Air Force, RAF, over the English Channel and Northern France. By November 1941, his tally had increased to 96, by which time he had earned the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves and swords. In November 1941, Werner Molders, who commanded the German fighter force as the General der Jagd Flieger, was killed while a passenger in a flying accident and Galland succeeded him, staying in the position until January 1945. As General der Jagd Flieger, Galland was forbidden to fly combat missions. In late January and early February 1942, Galland first planned and then commanded the Luftwaffe's air cover for the Kriegsmarine Operation Cerberus, which was a major success. It earned him the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves, swords, and diamonds. Over the ensuing years, Galland's disagreements with Reichsmarschall Hermann Göring about how best to combat the Allied Air Force's bombing of Germany caused their relationship to deteriorate. The Luftwaffe fighter force was under severe pressure by 1944, and Galland was blamed by Göring for the failure to prevent the Allied strategic bombing of Germany in daylight. The relationship collapsed altogether in early January 1945, when Galland was relieved of his command because of his constant criticism of the Luftwaffe leadership. Galland was then put under house arrest following the so-called fighter pilots' revolt in which senior fighter pilots confronted Goering about the conduct of the air war. In March 1945, Galland returned to operational flying and was permitted to form a jet fighter unit which he called Jagdverband 44. He flew missions over Germany until the end of the war in May. 
Galland's first flight was in an Albatross L101. Galland had two notable accidents, a heavy landing damaged the undercarriage of his aircraft and a collision. Galland was judged to have employed poor formation tactics in the latter incident. Galland applied to join the German army in the belief he had failed to pass. In the meantime, he carried on with his flight training. Flights in an Albatross L-75 and the award of a B-1 certificate allowed him to fly large aircraft over 2,500 kilograms, 5,500 pounds, in weight. He discovered the Army accepted his application, but the flying school refused to release him. By Christmas 1932, he had logged 150 hours flying and had obtained a B-2 certificate. 14. Early in 1933, Gallen was sent to the Baltic Sea Training Base at Varnemunde to train on flying boats. Gallen disliked learning what he perceived to be seamanship, but logged 25 hours in these aircraft. Soon afterward, along with several other pilots, he was ordered to attend an interview at the Zentrale der Verkehrs Flieger Schule, ZVS, Central Airline Pilot School. The group were interviewed by military personnel in civilian clothing. After being informed of a secret military training program being built that involved piloting high-performance aircraft, all the pilots accepted an invitation to join the organization. Into the Luftwaffe. In May 1933, Galland was ordered to a meeting in Berlin as one of 12 civilian pilots among 70 airmen who came from clandestine programs, meeting Hermann Göring for the first time. Galland was impressed by Göring and believed him to be a competent leader. In July 1933, Gallen traveled to Italy to train with the Reggio Aeronautica, Italian Air Force. In October 1935, during aerobatic maneuver training, he crashed a Falker Wolf FW-44 biplane and was in a coma for three days, other injuries were a damaged eye, fractured skull and broken nose. When Gallen recovered, he was declared unfit for flying by the doctors. A friend, Major Eitel, kept the doctor's report secret to allow Adolf to continue flying. The expansion of the Luftwaffe and his own Geschwader, wing, flooded the administration officers and Galland's medical report was overlooked. Within a year, Galland showed no signs of injury from his crash. In October 1936 he crashed an Arado R-68 and was hospitalized again, aggravating his injured eye. 13. It was at this point his previous medical report came to light again and Gallen's unfit certificate was discovered. Major Eitel was rumored to have undergone a court-martial, but the investigators dropped the charges. Galland, however, was grounded. He admitted having fragments of glass in his eye, but convinced the doctors he was fit for flying duty. Galland was ordered to undergo eye tests to validate his claims. Before the testing could begin, one of his brothers managed to acquire the charts. Adolf memorized the charts passing the test and was permitted to fly again. During the Spanish Civil War, Galland was appointed Staff El Capitan of a Condor Legion Unit, 3. Staffel of Jagd Group 88, J-88-88 Fighter Group, Note 1, which was sent to support the nationalist side under Franco at Farol from mid-1937. Galland flew ground attack missions in Heikel He-51s. In Spain, Galland first displayed his unique style, flying in swimming trunks with a cigar between his teeth in an aircraft decorated with a Mickey Mouse figure. When asked why he developed this style, he gave a simple answer. I like Mickey Mouse. I always have. And I like cigars, but I had to give them up after the war. Gallen flew his first of 300 combat missions in Spain with the J-88 commander Gothard Handrick, on 24 July 1937, near Brunette. During his time in Spain, Galland analyzed the engagements, evaluated techniques and devised new ground attack tactics which were passed on to the Luftwaffe. On 24 May 1938 Galland left Spain and was replaced by Werner Mulders. Before leaving he made 10 flights in the BF-109, deeply impressed with the performance of the aircraft, it persuaded him to change from a strike pilot to a fighter pilot. 27. 
Galland's fellow student and friend at the Kriegsschule in Dresden, Johannes Janka, later said of him a very good pilot and excellent shot, but ambitious and he wanted to get noticed. A parvenu. He was crazy about hunting anything, from a sparrow to a man. Invasion of Poland Just before the outbreak of war, Galland was promoted to Hauptmann. During the invasion of Poland from 1 September 1939 onward, he flew with four Staffel, two slash Lechwaga two. Equipped with the Henschel H's 123, nicknamed the biplane Stuka, supporting the German 10th Army. On 1 September, Galland flew alone in a Fessel Fi 156 Storch on a reconnaissance mission and was nearly shot down. The next day he flew ground attack missions in support of the 1st Panzer Division advancing to the Warta River. Gallant's Gushvoda flew intensive sorties in support of the Division and 16 Army Corps at Krakow, Radom, Deblin and Lvov. The German army had reached the Vistula River near Warsaw by 7 September. And the Luftwaffe had been executing the kind of close air support operations Galland had been advocating. Gallant participated in the maximum effort by the Luftwaffe during the Battle of Bsura. On the 11th of September, during one of his visits to the front, Adolf Hitler arrived at LG2 headquarters for lunch with the staff. Such was the state of the Polish Air Force and Polish Army, that by the 19th of September 1939 some German air units were withdrawn from the campaign. Gallen ceased combat operations on this date, having flown 87 missions. 31, after flying nearly 360 missions in two wars and averaging two missions per day, on 13 September 1939, Galland was awarded the Iron Cross second class. 32. After the end of the campaign, Galland claimed to be suffering from rheumatism and therefore unfit for flying in open cockpit aircraft, such as the H's 123. He tactfully suggested a transfer to a single-engine aircraft type with a closed cockpit would improve his condition. On 10 May 1940, the Wehrmacht invaded the Low Countries and France under the codename Fall Gelb. JG-27 supported German forces in the battle for Belgium. On the third day of the offensive, the 12th of May 1940, 7 kilometers, 4.3 miles, west of Liège, Belgium, at a height of about 4,000 meters, 13,000 feet, flying a Messerschmitt Bf 109, Galland, with Gustav Rudel as his wingman, claimed his first aerial victories, over two Royal Air Force, RAF, Hawker Hurricanes. Both aircraft were from No. 87 Squadron. The Hurricanes had been escorting Bristol Blenheim bombers to bomb bridges in the Netherlands. 38. Galland remembered, my first kill was child's play. An excellent weapon and luck had been on my side. To be successful, the best fighter pilot needs both, Galland pursued one of the scattering hurricanes and shot down another at low level. The pilot, a Canadian, flying officer Jack Campbell was killed. On the 6th of June 1940, Galland took over the command of 3 slash 26 Schlagita, 3 slash JG 26 3 RD group of the 26th fighter wing, with the position of Grupp in commander. Under his command were the 7, 8, and 9. Staffels with an establishment of 39 BF 109 S. His Staffel captains included Joachim Munchberg, Wilhelm Balthazar, and Gerhard Skopfel. Balthazar, Staffel Kapitan of 7. Staffel had mistakenly attacked Gallant during Fall Rot, Case Red. Being on the same radio frequency, Gallant was able to warn Balthazar before he opened fire. The remainder of the campaign passed without incident and on 26 June, Major Gothard Handrick took over command of JG-26. Gallant was pleased, having served under him during his Condor Legion days. Battle of Britain. From June 1940 on, Galland flew as the Gruppin commander of 3 slash JG 26, JG 26, fighting in the Battle of Britain. On the 19th of July 1940, he was promoted to Major and JG 26 moved to the Pas de Calais, 
where they were to remain for the next 18 months with three slash JAG-26 based at Kafirs. As the battles over the channel continued, Gallon shot down Spitfires on 25 and the 28th of July. 50, on the 1st of August 1940, Galland was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, Ritter Croix de Eisen and Kreutzus, for his 17 victories. Galland was summoned to Coronhol on the 18th of August 1940, and missed the intense air battle that day, known as the Hardest Day. During the meeting, Goering insisted that, in combat, BF-109 fighters escort BF-110s, which could not survive against single-engine fighters. As high-scoring aces, both Galland and Mulders shared their concerns that close escort of BF-110s and bombers robbed fighter pilots of their freedom to roam and engage the enemy on their own terms. They also pointed to the fact that German bombers flew at medium altitudes and low speed, the best height area and speed for the maneuverability of the Spitfire. Galland resented his pilots having to carry out a task unsuited to their equipment but Goering would not move from his position Galland claimed that fighting spirit was also affected when his pilots were tasked with close escort missions. Battle of Britain From June 1940 on, Galland flew as the Gruppin commander of 3-JAG-26, JG-26, fighting in the Battle of Britain. On 19 July 1940, he was promoted to Major and JG-26 moved to the Pas de Calais, where they were to remain for the next 18 months with 3-JG-26 based at Kafirs. As the battles over the channel continued, Gallon shot down Spitfires on 25 and 28 July. 50, on 1 August 1940, Galland was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross, Ritter Croix de Eisen and Kreutzus, for his 17 victories. Galland was summoned to Coronhol on 18 August 1940, and missed the intense air battle that day, known as the Hardest Day. During the meeting, Goering insisted that, in combat, BF-109 fighters escort BF-110s, which could not survive against single-engine fighters. As high-scoring aces, both Galland and Mulders shared their concerns that close escort of BF-110s and bombers robbed fighter pilots of their freedom to roam and engage the enemy on their own terms. They also pointed to the fact that German bombers flew at medium altitudes and low speed, the best height area and speed for the maneuverability of the Spitfire. Galland resented his pilots having to carry out a task unsuited to their equipment but Goering would not move from his position Galland claimed that fighting spirit was also affected when his pilots were tasked with close escort missions. In March 1941, Goering held a major conference for units in the West. After describing in detail the coming air offensive against Britain, he secretly admitted to Adolf Galland and Werner Mulders that there's not a word of truth in it. The Luftwaffe was to transfer to the Eastern Front. Although only approximately two fighter wings remained in the West for the next year and a half, many of the best fighter crews remained in that theatre. Similarly, the best equipment went to the West, industry supplied the Falker Wolf FW-190 to the Western Theater first. Small in numbers, no more than 180 aircraft, the Western fighter forces were among the best in the Luftwaffe. Now, promoted to Oberstleutnant, he continued to lead JG-26 in 1941 against the RAF fighter sweeps across Northern Europe. In early 1941, most of the Luftwaffe's fighter units were sent to the Eastern Front, or south to the Mediterranean Theater of Operations, MTO, leaving only JG-26 and Jagdgeschwader II, JG-2, as the sole single-engine fighter Geschwader in France. Galland received a telephone call from Goering on 10 May 1941, requesting Galland to intercept a Messerschmitt Bf 110 flown by Rudolf Hess heading for Scotland. Galland was unable to launch a full fighter sweep. However, Hess' flight was far to the north and he reached Scotland crashing his aircraft. Galland sent out fighters to conduct some sweeps so he could honestly claim to have carried out his orders but it was nearly dark and Galland ordered his pilots unused to night flying to stand down. 
In November 1941, he was chosen by Göring to command Germany's fighter forces General der Jagdflieger, succeeding Werner Molders who had just been killed in an air crash en route to attend the funeral of Ernst Tudert. Galland was not enthusiastic about his promotion, seeing himself as a combat leader and not wanting to be tied to a desk job. He was the youngest general in the armed forces. Soon afterward, on 28 January 1942, Galland was awarded the Knight's Cross of the Iron Cross with oak leaves, swords and diamonds, Ritterkreuz de Eisen and Kreuzes mit Eichenlaub, Schwerten und Brillanten, for his service as Jeschvader Commodore of JG-26. 102, although not keen on a staff position, soon after Galland's appointment, he planned and executed the German Air Superiority Plan, Operation Donnerkale, for the Kriegsmariners, German Navy, or War Marine, Operation Cerberus, from his headquarters at Yeva. 103, the German battleships Scharnhorst, Gneisenau and heavy cruiser Prince Eugen sailed from Brest, France, up the English Channel to Kiel, Germany. The operation caught the British off guard. The RAF attempted to intercept with the forces available, but the German fighter defences were able to shoot down 43 RAF aircraft with 247 British casualties. The Luftwaffe had prevented any damage on the ships by air attack. A strong proponent of the day fighter force and the defence of Germany, Galland used his position to improve the position of the Jagdwaffe. The need was now pressing, as Germany had declared war on the United States on the 11th of December 1941, and Galland was keen to build up a force that could withstand the resurgence of the Western Allied Air Forces in preparation for what became known as the Defense of the Rye Campaign. The first major crisis for Galland's command, under his tenure, occurred in 1943. Galland had been supporting operations in the area since April 1943, but the Tunisian defeat caused a reorganization of Axis air forces in the south. Luftflotte II was divided in two, with Luftflotte Southeast controlling the Balkans and a new Luftflotte II controlling Italy, Sardinia, Corsica, and Sicily. A general replacement of commanders also occurred. While from von Richthofen arrived as Luftflotte II commander, Galland, went to Sicily to control fighter operations. The number of fighters increased from 190 in mid-May to 450 in early July 1943. 109, close to 40% of all fighter production from 1 May to 15 July 1943 went to the Mediterranean theater and two new fighter wings, scheduled for Germany's defense, went south. The movement of fighters to redress Allied air superiority achieved only a rise in German losses, which reflected the superiority of Allied production. From 16 May to 9 July Allied forces flew 42,147 sorties and lost 250 aircraft to the Axis 325 as the air offensive gradually rendered airfields in Sicily inoperable. The weak German bomber force made only a feeble attempt to support the defense of Sicily. Losses too were high. In the first nine days of July 1943, Galland's command lost approximately 70 fighters. On the 14th day he was summoned to Berlin to explain the collapse of their defenses on the island. As Galland departed the last dozen operational Axis aircraft departed Sicily on the 22nd of July. Since the Allied invasion of Sicily, Galland had lost 273 German and 115 Italian aircraft and imposed a cost of only around 100 on Allied air forces. Galland's position as General der Jagdflieg brought him into gradual conflict with Goering as the war continued. Galland was often at odds with Goering and Hitler on how to prosecute the air war. From 1942 to 1944, the German fighter forces on all fronts in the European theater of operations, ETO, came under increasing pressure and Galland's relationship with Goering began to turn sour. The first distinct cracks began to appear in the spring of 1943. Galland suggested that the fighter forces defending Germany should limit the number of interceptions flown to allow sufficient time for regrouping and to conserve air strength. 
Only by conserving its strength and its precious resources, the fighter pilots, could the Luftwaffe hope to inflict damage on the bombers. Goering found the suggestion unacceptable. By October 1943, the fractious relationship came to the surface again. Galland met with Goering at Goering's estate, Schloss Veldenstein. During the conversation the need for new and improved interceptor aircraft arose. Goering, demanded heavily cannon-armed fighters be used en masse. Goering, prompted by the desires of Hitler, wanted cannons of some 900 kilograms, 2,000 pounds, in weight. Galland explained that such a weapon could not be used effectively in an aircraft, the cannon would be prone to jamming and the aircraft would be too difficult to maneuver. Galland also asserted the use of inappropriate weaponry such as the Messerschmitt Me 410, a favorite of Hitler's, had caused heavy losses. Galland argued such measures were deplorable and irresponsible. Goering disregarded Galland's arguments and continued his frequent attacks on the fighter force, accusing them of cowardice. Galland, as he always did, defended them, risking his career and, near the end of the war, his life in doing so. Galland stated that he could not agree to follow Goering's plans and requested to be dismissed from his post and sent back to his unit. Goering accepted, but two weeks later he apologized to Galland and attributed his behavior to stress. Galland continued in his post. Nonetheless, the arguments ultimately continued, mainly over aircraft procurement and armament for the defense of Germany from Allied bombing, and began to give rise to a growing personal rift between Goering and Galland. In November 1943 Galland issued a communique to the fighter forces, announcing the introduction of new weapons, such as heavily armed FW-190s, to engage of destroy Allied bombers through the use of massed and formation-based attack tactics at close range. He also passed on Goering's dissatisfaction with wing and squadron commanders that did not press their attacks in this manner. For the first time, Goering ordered his units, through Galland, to use ramming methods, and risk sacrificing the pilot. It was not the first occasion Galland had ordered this, the general demanded the same from his men during the Channel Dash operation in 1942. The plea was desperate. By the end of March, the daylight strategic bombing offensive had put the Luftwaffe under enormous pressure. It retarded, although only for a short period, the expansion of fighter production. Importantly, it had caused devastating attrition. American air forces continued unrelenting pressure for the duration of the war. There was no hope of recovery for Germany's daylight fighter forces under Galland's command and the Allied air forces were close to winning air superiority over all of Europe. A conference between Galland and Goering in mid-May 1944 underlined how enemy air operations were devastating the fighter force. Galland reported that Luftflotterei had lost 38% of its fighter pilots in April 1944, while Luftflotte III had lost 24%. On 23 May 1943, Galland flew an early prototype of the Messerschmitt Me 262 jet fighter. After the flight, he described his experience, it was as though angels were pushing. 125, Galland became an enthusiastic supporter of the aircraft, realizing its potential as a fighter rather than a bomber. 134, Galland hoped that the Mi-262 would compensate for the numerical superiority of the Allies. In a wartime report he wrote, In the last four months, January to April 1944, our day fighters have lost 1,000 pilots, we are numerically inferior and will always remain so, I believe that a great deal can be achieved with a small number of technically and far superior aircraft such as the, Mi, 262 and, Mi, 163. I would at this moment rather have one Mi 262 in action rather than five BF 109s. I used to say three 109s, but the situation develops and changes. Gallant's enthusiasm failed to appreciate the difficulties involved in transferring a design into production, especially under the circumstances. The Mi-262 was not Willy Messerschmitt's priority. The designer was involved in a battle with Milch from 1942 over the cancellation of the Messerschmitt Mi-209 in favor of the jet. 
There were also problems with the engines and series production was difficult because the company were making design changes at the same time they were working up production lines. Gallant succeeded in temporarily persuading Milch to support cancelling the Mi-209 program in favor of producing 100 Mi-262s by the end of 1943. 138, however, because of persistent problems with its turbojet engines and later, Hitler's determination to use it as a bomber, the Mi-262 was not developed as a fighter until late in the war. Despite Goering's apology after their previous dispute, the relationship between the two men did not improve. Goering's influence was in decline by late 1944 and he had fallen out of favor with Hitler. Goering became increasingly hostile to Galland, blaming him and the fighter pilots for the situation. In 1944, the situation worsened. A series of Asaf raids termed Big Week won air superiority for the Allies in February. By the spring of 1944, the Luftwaffe could not effectively challenge the Allies over France or the Low Countries. Gallant succeeded in temporarily persuading Milch to support cancelling the Mi-209 program in favor of producing 100 Mi-262s by the end of 1943. However, because of persistent problems with its turbojet engines and later, Hitler's determination to use it as a bomber, the Mi-262 was not developed as a fighter until late in the war. Hitler rejected Galland's plan. He hoped to improve Germany's position by winning a decisive victory on the Western Front. Hitler distrusted Galland's theory and believed him to be afraid and stalling for time. The Führer was also skeptical that the Luftwaffe could stop the American air offensive and was not willing to have German resources sit idle on airfields to wait for an improvement in flying conditions. Admittedly Galland's efforts had built up a useful reserve, but Hitler was now to use it in support of a land offensive. Goering and Hitler handed over the forces pooled by Galland to Peltz whom they had appointed commander of two. Jagged corps, responsible for virtually all fighter forces in the West. For his own safety, Galland went to a retreat in the Harz Mountains. 164, he was to keep the RLM informed of his whereabouts, but was effectively under house arrest. Hitler, who liked Galland, learned of the revolt and ordered that all this nonsense was to stop immediately. Hitler had been informed by Albert Speer, who in turn had been notified by one of Galland's close friends. After Hitler's intervention Goering contacted Galland and invited him to Korenhall. In light of his service to the fighter arm, he promised no further action would be taken against him and offered command of a unit of Mi-262 jets. Galland accepted on the understanding that Golub had no jurisdiction over him or his unit. Galland was initially assigned to command the Staffel of Jagdgeschwader 54, at that time stranded behind Soviet lines in the call and pocket. Galland never took up this command but was given the task of forming Jagdverband 44, JV 44. The unit was officially formed on the 22nd of February 1945. Galland did everything he could to introduce the Mi 262s to the wing as quickly as possible. Goering showed sympathy for Galland's efforts, which thus far had only 16 operational jets in February. General Joseph Kamuba was asked to assist Galland. Kampfschwader 51, KG 51 or Bomber Wing 51. On the 26th of April, Galland claimed his 103rd and 104th aerial victories against B-26s which were escorted by the 27th Fighter Group and 50th Fighter Group. Galland again made a mistake, he stopped to make sure his second victory was going to crash and he was hit by a SAF P-47 Thunderbolt piloted by James Finnegan. Galland nursed his crippled Mi-262 to the airfield, only to find it was under attack by more P-47s. Galland landed under fire and abandoned his jet on the runway. The battle was his last operational mission. Soon afterwards, he was sent to hospital for a knee wound that he had sustained during his last mission. By late April, the war was effectively over. On the 1st of May 1945, Galland attempted to make contact with United States Army forces to negotiate the surrender of his unit. The act itself was dangerous. 
SS forces roamed the countryside and towns executing anyone who was considering capitulation. On 14 May 1945, Galland was flown to England and interrogated by RAF personnel about the Luftwaffe, its organization, his role in it and technical questions. Galland returned to Germany on 24 August and was imprisoned at Hohen Paisenberg. On 7 October, Galland was returned to England for further interrogation. He was eventually released on 28 April 1947. Adolf Galland died at 1.15 in the morning of Friday 9 February 1996. His body was buried at the cementerio in Oberwinter on 21 February. A memorial service was held on 31 March at the St. Laurentius Church.